600 spot on your dial. WICC, Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm Bud Finch, and I'll be back right after Andy Carano's news next over the sound of New Haven, W-E-L-I. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Steele of WTIC Hartford speaking to you from the Army's Bradley Field in central Connecticut where 25 or 30 big four-engine bombers have arrived in the past hour or so. More are coming in all the time. The latest news from the WTHT Hartford Times Newsroom. Town Hartford, we bring you Hartford Speaks, transcribed. I'm Bob Maher, here's Una King. Well, you bright little spring boy, you, you're anticipating it a little bit, aren't you? That's number 83, everybody, at WTIC, our Dickie Robinson Countdown Show. As we check out the top 100 records for 1967. The Ken Griffin Show. WPOP. From high atop Radio Mountain at 95.7, this is WBMI Hartford Meriden. My name is Dan Bloom. Connecticut Radio Memories, a series chronicling the first six decades of Connecticut's radio stations, as told by the people behind the microphones and behind the scenes. Episode 6, Pop Goes Your Radio, the story of Hartford's first Top 40 station. WPOP was born in July 1956, when WGTH Radio was sold and the call letters were changed. One of WPOP's first program directors, Del Racy, remembers. It was owned by uh, General Tire and uh, RKO Unique. They sold Channel 18. They owned Channel 18 and WGTH. And uh, what happened there was the telebroadcasters bought the WGTH for 225000 I don't remember what CBS paid for Channel 18. So half of the crew stayed with uh, Channel 18 and uh, half of us stayed with uh, GTH. And I call it as we changed to WPOP and we moved over to the Shelburne apartment building on the Sinem Tree Hill. Bobby Scott. Del Racy was our program director. It was more fun than you could possibly think of. It wasn't long. Uh, I did the morning show, and it wasn't long after that. Uh, I became program director and was allowed the opportunity to introduce the format called a Top 40 Radio. Pop Radio WPOP. The early WPOP was uh, inspired, at least from a programming sense, by Ken Cooper. Richard Ward Fatherly. Ken Cooper was a consultant and helped to put the WPOP, then early days, top 40 sound together. WPOP was a top 40 station. Doug Wardwell. Probably the first top 40 station in Hartford long before WDRC. Bobby Scott. In those days, and for quite a number of years, people I think in the Hartford area recall that Bob Steele pretty much owned the morning ratings on WTIC. And WPOP and WDRC really were competing for the ratings for the rest of the day and into the evening. And uh, it got its name as Top 40 from looking at a variety of billboard magazine sales and uh, disc jockeys in those days were much freer to do their own programming. Uh, it was not uh, coming from satellite, it was all done at the studio. And so uh, we had uh, the Top 40 list, which was what was selling in the area from Billboard magazine. That's how we got those listings. And then we also made our own history by playing uh, songs that we felt, the disc jockeys felt, were uh, up and coming. And so uh, between the two, we had our picks, and then we got the rest from Billboard magazine. And uh, that's the way that went. Top 40 uh, in Hartford was an extremely popular WPLP pop. Uh, 1410 on the dial was the station to listen to. We had a wonderful lineup of personalities at uh, WPOP. I hired Don Blair. I got an offer from Del Racy at WPOP in Hartford. Don Blair. Just at a time when that radio station was taking off big time in top 40 rock and roll. They really started to hit it big in the mid to late 50s and I joined that staff in 1958. And by then, I had moved up almost to $100 a week. Can you imagine? In those days, POP was the hot number in town, soon to be joined head-on by WDRC. And that went on for quite a few years through the rock and roll era. So we played the Billboard Top 30. And if Doris Day happened to have a hit, you played that right after the Four Seasons. No problem. No, no hassle. People expected it of you. Jack Breitman, air name Jack Brooks. Don Blair was big in the afternoon. Fred Swanson. Don, he used to go on around 6 or 7 o'clock. I think it was the Connecticut Ballroom they call that. Richard Ward Fatherly. Don Blair was the host of It's 
afternoon popular music countdown called Connecticut Ballroom. And it was Don Blair's Connecticut Ballroom. And Bob Scott nicknamed me the Teddy Bear. So I also, I always called myself, you know, Don Blair the Teddy Bear. In order to establish the hits in Hartford, no reason. we had pulled the record stores for the top tunes of, the, of that week. But I found out that the, these guys were hyping particular records, if I may use that expression. And so we started our own survey. Uh, we brought in a rotary system with some telephones and had some uh, high school girls come in. And during the Don Blair show, the Connecticut Ballroom would, would conduct this survey. We play the tunes and the listeners would vote on them. That's how we established the hits for the week. And then we had other talents on P.O.P. like Ray Summers, who called himself the Toon Tycoon. Charming guy. Howie Burlingame was our morning man. Get up and go, go, go. Everybody's in town. Another good day today. Get up and go, go, go. We're with you all the way. Off Radio WPOP. Howie Brewling gave my morning guy at that time, I think in 57, he was a rhyming disc jockey. Everything he did was in rhyme. And a top 40 afternoon show with Al Chartel and by a kid by the name of Douglas. My air shift was the afternoon shift. Doug Wardwell, air name Doug the Bug. I had, oh, like about uh, 2 o'clock to uh, 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I was called Doug the Bug. <laughs> Buggy dog, baby. Oh, yeah. And I uh, used that, Monica. And then uh, in the evening, I used uh, Cool Ghoul, the Cool Ghoul, in the evening. Some people kept their own personalities and they didn't change. Uh, other people had personalities. In those days, I was a personality person on WPOP. If you contrast that with WTIC in Hartford, they all sounded the same, like they came out of the same cereal box. Everybody was, this is WTIC, WTIC, Hartford. We were all different. Hey, baby, this is WPLP at the top of your dial. Oh, yeah. This is the Bug Doug bugging you from now until you know when. And then the cool ghoul takes over, baby. I'm in the driver's seat. And right now, here's Bo Diddley. Listen to him, will you? Go, cool, baby. That's the way we did it. And we, again, played. Uh, I was able to select songs that I wanted to play. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much of love drives a man insane. You broke my will, a bullet thrill. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. In those days, the DJs received 45 uh, records from all the major distributors. And we went over those after the top 40 was selected. And we played the top 40 from 1 to 40 and then started all over again after the picks. And then I was able to select from whatever came in and I auditioned and listened to for the particular songs that I thought were going to be up and going. So that's what I did. Here's the record that's gonna be me. The word payola comes up. Did it exist? Yes, it exists, but payola exists everywhere today. Payola exists in the corporate world, exists in the business world. But the disc jockeys were especially singled out for taking pay for uh, featuring certain records probably have heard of that. Did that happen in Hartford? Yes, it happened in Hartford. Everybody did that. Uh, people would, uh, and how would you get paid? You remember at the start of the interview, I said, where disc jockeys used to pick some of their own records, and uh, I would pick a record. And if the record made it to the top of the charts, then the distributors would say to you, hey, baby, I appreciate what you did, and for that, I'd like you to pay you off, give you something. What would they give you? Well, they might, they're a DECA distributor, they might say to you, well, uh, I carry all kinds of hi-fi equipment, maybe you want to come in and grab some hi-fi equipment, and uh, I won't charge you for it. That could happen. Or they give you free tickets to some games, that could happen. But it was never anything big, it was never anything horrendous, but uh, that's the only payola that I can remember receiving. And everybody kind of received those little uh, royalties. Called them, but that's all. It was nothing like today, where Mr. Hugh uh, for the Clinton campaign and got her, you know, uh, eight hundred thousand. Though she paid the eight hundred fifty thousand dollars back, and he made her three million bucks. Mm. I mean, if that isn't payola, I don't know what is. Uh, this was just a small types of payola which we received for doing things for people. <laughs> 
And a lot of times we didn't do it for them. We did it because we really liked the record. I never did it for pay. I did it because I liked the record. I was always surprised when someone would call me and they would say, Doug, we thank you for what you did and uh, we'd like to have you have something. Uh, here's some tickets to the Bushnell. Here's something to go off for your wife, have a nice supper or dinner or something like that. But it was not. Uh, it was nothing to the extent of uh, being uh, lots of money in your pocket or a new car or anything like that. In between your stint, your gig, whatever you were doing, you would go into the announce booth, would take your commercial copy with you, and you would do all of the commercials for the next day and give those to the traffic department, and those would be all ready for the next uh, day's broadcast. And we used all kinds of different voices for that. You had to be multi-talented, multi-voiced to do that. So uh, you might do, he used a Peter Laurie for one, a Cool Go for another one, the Uncle Silas for another one, and a Top Shock for the other one. And that way, a, uh, people listening thought we had, you know, maybe uh, a cadre of two dozen announcers, when actually there were only about three or four of us, but uh, that's the way that went. I even drove a bug car. I had a little Saab, and I put a big key on the end of it so that it looked like it would wind up, and people would uh, see the bug sign, and they would follow me around. I'd have a regular caravan, you know, Doug the Bug, there he is. How do we know it's his car? Because it's a buggy car with a key on it. That's the way that was done. We had uh, people that followed us and listened to us regularly. Uh, you know, just about everywhere I went, people were listening to WPOP. Uh, it was uh, the station, I guess, that people listened to for Top 40 Sounds. What? I had Doug the Bug clubs because I did record hops. I went out uh, on remotes. Uh, I don't think stations do that anymore, but we had remotes. Record hops. Don Blair. You know, everybody did one or two record hops a week. It, it probably equaled or, or surpassed our, our wages at the radio station. Many of us did uh, what they call record hops. Bobby Scott. For shows, we did a number of shows over at the Bushnell and uh, had a wonderful array of entertainers to come in. I know that, you know, off the top, uh, Connie Francis and Johnny Mathis. And one of the highlights was an opportunity for me to interview Tony Bennett and to spend some time with Tony, who was just a, a class act and a, and a wonderful I went to Crystal Lake Ballroom in, in uh, Rockville, and uh, there we had the Battle of the Bands. We had guest appearances by the guest artists, uh, whoever they were on the air. They would come in and make guest appearances. Live broadcast, no recording, this is all live from Crystal Lake. And so we had wonderful opportunity to meet many of these great artists and also bring them to Hartford and to Hartford Radio. So it was, in fact, really a, a wonderful era. It truly was. We even had you know, people who would carry us around on their shoulders. It was like hero worship in those days. We don't have that anymore, I guess. People just listen in and that's it. <laughs> Wipe out. I remember one remote we did, uh, which got a lot of attention. Uh, one of my guys locked me in the truck of a Buick, and uh, the whole concept was get Doug the bug out of the back of the truck before he suffocates. So people were honking their horns going by. People stopped to see if they could uh, get us out of there. And uh, of course, I was still getting some air, but I had to be released at some point. And that was the whole gist of the program to get me released from the back of that trunk. Inside the trunk, I had the mic right inside the trunk, and I was doing the broadcast in there. And I had headphones, so I could hear the engineer say, hey, here he is, he's back again, is he still alive? If I don't have much air left, and if you don't get me out of here fast, I'm gonna die. So stop by, ask for the key, haggle with a guy, buy a car, do whatever you have to do, but get me the hell out of here. And that's the way that went. In the evening, we had Bobby Scott. Don Blair. Who was a tremendous hit with the girls because he was young and single and good-looking. And uh, Bobby, you know, they, we would call him Booby Scoot instead of Bobby Scott. Bob Goldberg. Air name, Bobby Scott. I graduated from Emerson College in Boston and uh, had returned. I uh, am Boston, uh, in Hartford, uh, born and raised, and came back to the city uh, during the summer looking for employment and uh, had auditioned at some radio stations. In 1959 was, in my opinion, really a very magical time for Hartford Radio. And it was about that time that WPOP had been a uh, mutual news radio station, which was purchased by a fellow out of Kansas City, Missouri, by the name of uh, Scott Kilgore. This guy, Scott Kilgore, who owned the most influential Top 40 station in the country in Kansas City. And Scott wanted to change the format of the radio station, and so I was hired as a uh, part-time announcer for WPOP, but uh, had always uh, hoped to be a uh, full-time employee and uh, disc jockey on the radio station. Bobby, thanks to a couple of wise 
cracking, gum-chewing radio station executives pulled one of the greatest stunts in Connecticut radio history. He was doing weekend radio. Bobby Scott was a weekend uh, part-time announcer. Go racing. And uh, I guess, you know, top 40 people did, did crazy things. We had a lot of promotions that we had from time to time. And Scott Kilgore he sent a guy, oh, Ken Cooper. He sent this guy, this promotional genius, Ken Cooper, came to P.O.P. And he looked at Bob Scott and he said, guess what? You're going to become the unhappy weekend kid who locks himself in the studio, demanding a full-time job, and sits in the studio and plays the same stupid song over and over again. And we thought during the Children Marching Kong, or during that era in 1959, that we would have Bobby lock himself in the studio on that weekend and play nothing but the Children's Marching Song by Mitch Miller. They gave him several boxes of the Children's Marching Song. We had developed a uh, publicity stunt in which I locked myself in the studio and played the same song, which was Mitch Miller's children's marching song, for 12 straight hours. How did that song go? Do you remember? I do a little bit. Uh, this old man, he played one. He played knick-knack on my drum. That's about as much of the uh, song as I can recall at this point. This old man. out of the studio or unlock the studio until management agreed to give him a full-time job. The radio station at that time was located at uh, 600 Asylum Street, which was an apartment complex. And uh, so at noontime, which is when I started on a Sunday afternoon, I started to play the song. Never made any, um, never recognized the song on the air. I just continued to play the song and, and talk and do some commercials. It was about an hour and a half into the broadcast that afternoon that the uh, superintendent of the Shelbourne Apartments came down to the front of the window, the studio window, and told me that he had received a telephone call from one of the tenants indicating that the disc jockey had died. The uh, song was just continuing to play. So that was the beginning of recognizing that the stunt was having some impact. And of course, it was the talk of the town. People riding around in their cars saying, this idiot, I, I turned him on an hour ago and he's still playing the same thing. Oh, I tell you, we, you know, we, we had them all, from all over town, not to mention the kids at uh, Trinity College. Later on in the afternoon, Trinity College students turned their radios on to the station and turned them towards the quad and turned the volume all the way up so the quad was filled with the, the children's marching song. And people were calling the police, get somebody down there. Later on in the early evening, about 300 students marched down from Trinity College campus to the radio station on Asylum Street, which then brought a significant number of police. I believe that it was somewhere around 20 policemen came also to the studio and the students tried breaking into the studio door, which fortunately they were not able to do. And a couple of policemen directed me to stop playing the song and to play something else. Well, the Hartford Current sent a photographer down and took a picture of Bobby sitting behind the microphone with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. They knew darn well it was a scam, but they ran it anyway. So ultimately, all of that was reported uh, on the next day of the uh, front page of the Hartford Current. It was the talk of the, of the water coolers. The, are you yeah. kidding? That made that station overnight. It put WPOP on the map. So we found a slot for Bobby from 7 to 9 p.m., Monday through Friday, the Bobby Scott Show. And they gave me an opportunity to have a full-time position with WPOP as an on-air personality, which I enjoyed and appreciated the opportunity for many years. And Bobby Scott, <laughs> it was terrific for it. And, and that's why the kids really, really took to him, because he became a household name overnight. And he could get two or three record hops a week when sometimes I was just hoping for one, because the girls were, the kids were just crazy about him. And all the uh, record distributors made darn sure that when a, when a record artist came through, like a Freddie Cannon or a Johnny Tillotson or a Bobby Rydell or a Brenda Lee, if there was only one record hop they could get to, it was Bobby's. <laughs> people on the show. I had James Darren and Bobby Darren. I had Bobby Darren at Record Hop when he first came out with Splish Splash in 1958. Well, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett came to P.O.P. one day. Tony Bennett had come to Hartford to promote one of his um, albums, and his pianist for many years was a fellow by the name of Ralph Sharon. And Ralph Sharon and Tony Bennett were going to do live the recording up at a restaurant in West Hartford, and so Tony 
Tony was my last interview, and we were on our way up to West Hartford. He had asked if he and I could ride together, and I said, you know, certainly that was fine. We came out of the radio station and started up Farmington Avenue, got just a short distance, and, and embarrassingly enough, I had a flat tire, and so I had to pull over, and I had no idea where the jack or anything else was and how to um, replace the tire, and to my surprise, the next thing when I looked up, Tony's jacket was off and had rolled up his sleeves, and in fact, he replaced my tire for me. Uh, Dean Pitney. Another guy that we befriended big time at P.O.P., because he lived locally, Gene Pitney. He lived up in, uh, in uh, Crystal Lake. He and the redhead, we called her, his wife. And Gene Pitney taught me how to water ski on Crystal Lake. That's how good a friend he was. Johnny Tillotson. Oh, yeah. Johnny Tillotson was a real favorite at P.O.P. Came in many times, and Cadence Records was so cheap, they wouldn't even give the kid money for the ho for hotels. And we put him up at friends' houses in West Hartford. Yeah, save the kid some money. But yeah. first, he would, he'd do all, as many record hops as you asked him to. It was terrific. But you had some very talented morning people. Don Blair. Controversial in their day. Not like Mr. Stern or any uh, the people that are crossing the line big time these days, but kind of naughty. They pushed the envelope. Dick Brown. One time when Dick Brown, our then morning man, mentioned a woman's bra straps on the air, somebody called the police. And Hartford police actually came to the radio station. You have a man here who was talking about a bra on the air? I mean, it was ridiculous. You didn't say hell or damn. It wasn't done. But they just ran circles around all the proprieties of the time. And the other guy we had that was famous for quite a while was Doc Downey. We had, in the morning, Jack Brooks, Morton Downey Jr., Sean Morton Downey Jr., Doc Downey was what he was called. Morton Downey Jr., his dad had been a famous Irish tenor during the 30s on radio and owned half of Coca-Cola. Morton Downey Jr. is famously from Connecticut. Joey Reynolds. His father was a famous Irish tenor who was the number one star in the country at one time. And years and years ago, if you want to remember what he sang, it was Carolina Moon, Keep Shining. His father raised the kids, three kids in Connecticut, and they went to school with the Kennedys. And Doc Downey, because his initials were M.D., Morton Downey, spent most of his life in Connecticut. And Doc was a rebel son. The father practically disowned Doc. And Doc was very controversial, had a very controversial talk show on TV for years, probably back in the 70s. He later went on to become a big TV personality, was married to Lee Remick for a while. And he was a morning man at P.O.P. W.P.O.P. He was pretty down, probably in his lowest ebb as a broadcaster when he got hired at WPOP as the morning man. And one morning, as a matter of fact, when Paul came in to do the news shift, he found Downey on the floor, his chair tipped over, flat on his back, out cold. Whether he had knocked himself out or had a seizure of some sort. But by the time I arrived, they had called the ambulance and they were dragging Doc Downey out to the hospital. And Paul had to take over not only the news shift, but his DJ shift as well. And one day some local merchant called because he was running out on some big bills on haberdashery, clothing, suits, shoes, everything else, and no, you know, sending no money. And I gave these people at the store a, kind of a line on how to get in touch with him or how, where to find him. And I came in one morning and Doc Downey, his face was beat red, livid. He was screaming mad at Don Blair and he was taking my attache case and dumping its contents. Not, not they were that, that important, all over the studio because I had ratted on him. And then I saw him years later when I was with NBC in New York and we were doing the relighting of the Statue of Liberty. This is 1980, was 81, 82. And across the fence, I look and there's Morton Downey, Doc Downey. And I went over to say hi and he extended his hand like we'd never had a, you know, a difference of opinion. And a couple of years later, he started doing TV spots because he'd been diagnosed with inoperable, incurable lung cancer right. because he was a heavy smoker. And he would appear on TV regularly looking at you and saying, don't be a jerk like I was. Give up the darn cigarettes. This is Pop Radio WPOP. In the old days when we were battling DRC, if you want to call it that, uh, it was us in, in that late period of, of the 1950s, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Del Racy. Jack Brooks I hired as our news director along with Paul Smith. He was a Saul Stockman. I tried him as, an, as a morning man, but he had trouble getting up, so we, we moved him over into the news department. He wound up as the morning newsman at WINS in New York. Now, this was 1960. Jack Breitman, air name Jack Brooks. 
And WPOP was the first rock and roll radio station. Del Racy was the program director. Phil Zoppi was the manager. They were trying to make a name for themselves. WDRC had entered the picture and had a very good news department. And so the two of them were battling out for listeners about their music. But Phil wanted to beef up the news department. So he asked me if I would come in and be his news director, go on the air and build a news department so that we could compete with WDRC. And it was at WPOP on November 22nd, 1963, that I was on the air with Lou Terry and got the first bulletins from Dallas on the assassination of President Kennedy. The uh, United Press International uh, ticker tape, it would ring five bells for the bulletin. It would ring ten bells if there was something really important coming on. And so sometime about one o'clock in the afternoon, the bells started to go off on the machine. And I would run to the t- to the ticker tape because it was otherwise a very quiet day. And the ticker tape would stop. Nothing would come out. Then it would start to go again. And it would be egg prices from Chicago. And so I would go away and say, well, you know, what, what are those 10 bells about? Then the 10 bells would ring again. So I'd run back and it would stop and it would hiccup a few times and then it would come back on with hog prices from Chicago. And finally, a one-liner comes through, garbled, but it comes through with a sentence that I could make out, but because it was so garbled, I was really afraid to put it on the air. It was, Dallas, the president has been shot, possibly fatally, period, finished. And then go back to egg prices again. What is a newsman in Hartford supposed to do about this? I thought, well, I guess I really should get on the air with it. I heard all the bells. It must be serious. It's got to be true. I'll get on the air with it. So I told Lou Terry, give me a mic. We had a news booth, and I went on with a bulletin. But we didn't get anything for the next five minutes. And that was the hardest part of that day. Uh, Eventually, it all began to to flow. But that first 10 minutes after that bulletin, and waiting for that bulletin, were probably the most trying times that I could possibly have lived through as a newsman. These were the voices of the people on the streets of Hartford. Some sad, some distressed, some faltering, but all honest words. It was a terrible thing that, about all, I don't know too much about it as yet. Well, it's not very good for the country. I can't say anything. I'm heartbroken. Well, I think it was a terrible thing. And, uh, of course, a lot of people don't believe in a lot of the things that he did, but with something like this, is a very disaster. Well, I, it's a dreadful shock, not only to me, but I think to everyone who was uh, in Fox's when I heard the news. And uh, I feel that uh, it's going to be very, very hard uh, as far as to carry on without him. I think we've lost great direction. I just think it's a terrible thing, that's all. Well, I think it's terrible. I mean, um, it, it makes, us, makes me feel as though... Um, you know, the world's running by itself. It was off of it, you know, someone from the United States shot their own president. I don't think anyone could take his place because without Ke- uh, Kennedy, the world isn't any place. I mean, he was a great leader, and uh, he tried to help the world as much as he can, and at this time, it's, it's a great loss because now we really need him. WPOP, first person on January 15, 1964, at 7.45 p.m., this is news editor Michael Lawless with the 40th edition of WPOP First Person News. It's 25 degrees under cloudy skies in Hartford. Page one headline story, Republican Senator Thurston B. Morton of Kentucky in Hartford tonight to address the new Republican victory dinner has come up with a possible solution to the succession problem. He told a news conference that if a president should die in office, the new president, the former vice president, would then nominate a person for his old post. Broadcasting as a community service of the University of Hartford, this is WWUH West Hartford, WAPJ Torrington, WDJW Summers, and WWEB Wallingford. And now back to Connecticut Radio Memories. Jack Brooks. We had Joey Reynolds at night. That was a big thing. Rusty Potts. Joey Reynolds right at the beginning of the top 40 days, and Joey was just sensational. Joey Reynolds. He's a fine guy, and I think one of the most unique talents. Don Blair. He could be very funny without being gross. And that's a lesson that a few other people we could mention should learn. You don't have to fill the air with vulgarity in order to make people laugh. At least you don't have to do that for me. (laughs) So uh, I I, I really think the guy is is, is a fine, fine talent. Joey was brought in to boost the ratings, and, and he was the wild man 
for, of Hartford for a while. Morton Downey Jr. got me to come to Hartford. Joey Reynolds. My story with him is that we worked together in Syracuse. And while we were in Syracuse, I was on in the afternoon, he was on in the morning, we were disc jockeys. We took a liking to each other, we even became roommates. He's a great guy, and a very, very interesting guy. He got fired in Syracuse. Uh, what he did was he made fun of the nuns and the priests. In those days, it was scandalous. I mean, nobody did that. He said that he was going to get his mother superior, one of the principals of the school, a watch for Christmas. But he wasn't going to give her the whole watch because he was going to give her the works on New Year's. <laughs> or some outrageously sexual comment about nuns. He got fired for it. Yeah. Both of us were always losing jobs anyway. I've had about 38 of them. But, <laughs> but at that point, I just began my career in crime of being fired as an outrageous disc jockey, for which we both fought for that title, I think, at one time. Maybe he saw himself in me. He was older. So he uh, got fired in Syracuse, and they gave me both of the shows, the morning and the afternoon. I got a call from him from Hartford, and he said, Come on along. I have a great job for us. I'm programming WPOP in Hartford, and you will be on the air, and you'll be a big star, and it's a great station, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, so, so Donnie called me from Hartford, said he was programming WPOP. Well, he was somewhat of a liar. So when he went to Hartford, he called me, and I came to Hartford, and he was not program director, and I was staying over there at the Y on Asylum, and uh, he was full of crap. There was no job. And Donnie came into this whole configuration not telling the truth and then i found out that everything he did was an exaggeration because he was he had a, a vivid imagination so uh, once when i confronted him i says you know you're lying and he says no 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 i'm not lying i just say things and then i make them happen so i thought oh here we go <laughs> anyhow that was the downy piece i got on the air in hartford and having been lied to that I had a job, I was only sitting in, but I didn't know that because he had structured it with the manager. And I was sitting in until the new guy came up from somewhere in Florida. When I found that out, I just went bonkers on the air, and I told the audience, and I had fun with it, and I started to screw around more and more and more. The audience bonded with me, and we became one, and the station took off like a rocket, as they say. And I stayed on the air doing, doing that for a long time. And they didn't put the other guy, when he came up from Florida, they did not put him on the air, they put me on. Now, don't forget, when I first started on the air in Hartford, nobody was talking like a regular person. They were doing this puke thing. Hey, everybody, it's WPOP, you know, WDIC, everybody, Dick Robinson here. You know, they were not talking. They were doing this routine. They were another person, essentially. You know, they were over the intros of records. Hey, everybody, here's Gene Pitney, you know, that thing. It was a sing-song thing. It wasn't a direct communication thing like I'm talking to you now and I uh, so I when I was in, in Syracuse I discovered the idea of doing that because I simply didn't want to do the other thing they had an echo chamber and I used to turn it off I hated it because it was too fake and the the echo chamber was to give an ambiance to give a real important sound and the jingles and I used to make fun of all that crap that's how I that's how I got the audience's attention because I started to defy the the systems that were routine they were routine and so when I got to Hartford, I had developed more of that. And when they told me that I wasn't going to finish the radio show, that somebody was coming in to do it, I just went crazy on the air. I said, well, screw these guys. You're not going to throw me off the air because some guy's coming up from Florida. You know, I, I just said it on the air. And I played the records I wanted to play and did what I wanted to do. WPLP is a place where I started to get a cult audience. Very much like, if you recall, Howard Stern did in the uh, early days of NBC. And very much like Donnie when he first went on Channel 9 in New York with his television talk show. So we all had this in our genes. That's what I'm bringing you to. But it started in Connecticut. And even Howard came to work in Hartford, you know, years later. I mean, it's a very interesting, fertile soil. Connecticut had a great uh, deal of intellect. You know, the kids' fathers and mothers were, I think it was a, not an industrial city, although New Britain is, you know. But the but Hartford was very white-collar. And I think, uh, you know, the, the parents sent their kids off to good schools. They had a, a, no income tax in the state. It was a relatively wealthy place, higher end, I would say. So that created a soil for some kind of a, an irreverence. This is my own thesis now. And because Connecticut, you could get away with a lot of things intellectually people were smart and and uh, glib I don't think we could have gotten away with any of this crap down south for instance the other thing about Hartford it, it was uh, you know Hartford Syracuse and Flint Michigan were test markets for products for companies like Procter and Gamble because they were diversified they had the right balance of people to be able to test things and when Joe Amatura bought the station he had owned an all-news talk station in Indianapolis I, he met me in New York and I rode in on the train with him 
from New York. I went to New York. I met him in New York and came in on the train to Hartford. And he told me I was 19. He said, you're too young to be a program director. Although I was highly successful. You know, the station was zooming. It was even beating DRC at the time. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I was very popular. And Armateur was an He didn't understand popularity. He understood uh, business. And this is the beginning of that particular thing is where, see, where radio and records were married, now we see business is going to marry radio, do you see? I mean, it always was a business, but it wasn't the primary interest. Then the people started to come in who saw it profitably, and they changed the laws of radio very, very slowly. And now you know where one person owns 1,500 stations. I mean, this all, this all started back then. So you had a guy like Joey Matura who knew Zippo, and I don't not like him, incidentally. This is not not liking him. Plus, he's a tag, and I'm a tag. <laughs> I like him on a lot for a lot of reasons, but I thought he was an <laughs> with me. I thought he was stupid. He never got to be where I had that station when I was there. Never, never. They never made that. They made a, a reasonable amount of audience and money, but he never got the prominence that I had. I was actually beating DRC. So that's the keynote of that one. And, 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 you know, at that time, I don't forget, I made Cherry. I hit record for four seasons. I played it for four hours, and uh, uh, I got outrageously uh, got fired, you know. Put the same record over and over again. From yeah, I was P.O.P. when I did that. It's on the back of the album, of uh, the Cherry album. You know, it's documented. When I left there, because he hired older guys to run it, and I was a younger, I was a kid. Yeah. Can you imagine? It's the reverse of what's happening now. Uh, so, you know, God has a great sense of humor. W.P.O.P. Ken Griffin. Bill Bland. Ken Griffin did nights. When I was working at WBRY. Ken Griffin. There was a guy named Hermie Dressel who was a promotion man for Mercury Records who actually was the drummer for the Woody Herman band, and he gave up that and became a promotion man for Mercury Records. Back in those days, they had promotion men. They used to go around the radio stations and have people play their records. So he came to me one day and said, you know, you're funny on the radio. I said, well, it's okay. I think I can probably get you a better job. So he did. Actually, he called up a guy named Zach Land at WH2N in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I was, I was making $55 a week in Waterbury, and I ended up making $155 a week in Springfield, and I did that for three years, and then they called me at WPOP in Hartford and said, we want to hire you, and we'll pay you $250 a week. I said, holy Christ, so that, this was, we're talking back in the 60s, early 60s now, if that, so that's when I went to Hartford again. The Ken Griffin Show, which in turn is a subdivision of Kaiser Aluminum. Hmm. This is Poppin' Hartford, a subdivision of the world's greatest station itself. The happy home, <laughs> the good guys. Oh, no. Take the same instrumental track and let's put new lyrics to it and have a hit all over again. Walking through the jungle just the other day. <laughs> Gene Simmons, baby. Mind of my business was going my way. He at me. We weren't disc jockeys. Hey. Right could be a disc jockey. You could hire a monkey and teach him how to spin records. We were air personalities. Back in those days, you got hired because you were funny and you had a lot of fun on the radio. Anybody could play a record. We played records, but that wasn't the name of the game. <laughs> personalities were celebrities like Don Imus was and is or, and Joey Reynolds and so many more. We're air personalities. We got hired to be funny. When you get hired to play records, any jerk could play records. Bob Piva. Ken had uh, a couple of imaginary characters, Fats and Rocky. Uh, that's fun too, and her husband Rocky. Oh, uh, 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 mm. Day of the Americans, mm, 28 minutes now before 10 o'clock. I got a letter for you from Rock. I mean, I got a like, letter for Rock from a uh, kid named Jerry. You want to read it? No, you read it. I can't wait to bust. <laughs> All right, Rock. Yeah, that's me. That's how it starts. Yeah, it says Rock. Man, the reason I'm writing to you is because I know you'll read it. Dad, your boss, and man, well, like, how could you make the hitch to the fat? Oh, man, like all us, way out here on the other side of the tubes, are letting you down. You're the great one, Rock. We now wait. Yamaha's forever. Yamaha! I'm for that. I'm for that Yamaha? I'm for that Yamaha. Signed, Gerald Granatosh. Gerald Granatosh. Yamaha, I'm for that Gerald Granatosh. Fast Fontoon and Rocky Hill. I can't do the Fast Fontoon voice. She was the Fast Fontoon the weather balloon. And I used to do a high voice. And then, of course, she married Rocky Hill. And he, hey, hey, I'm Rocky Hill. I'm Fast Fontoon. Well, that, that was it. Of course, it was higher then. But. Oh, gee, it's late. I'm getting so old. Watching my baby back home. Oh, my 
for a bat. What are you two doing? Wait a minute, I'm seeing. I'm going to be a... You've heard of, um, what's her name, Sophie Tucker? Yeah. Well, I'm going to be her. I'm going to just... She has to just kick off sooner or later, you know, get out of showbiz, so I'm going to take over because I'm young, you know. <laughs> he could do these voices, and he could do them so quickly that it actually sounded like there were two or three people in the studio. I mean, he would just bing, 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 bing. He, I'm going to sing one of them old, one of them old church songs, right? Yeah, get the torch. No, I mean, um, what's an old song like? Yes, we have now banana. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> they were so realistic that I can actually remember one evening at WPLP when a woman showed up and she had baked a cake for Fats' birthday. And she showed up to deliver this cake to Fats, who's, of course, an imaginary character. But the audience didn't know that Fats was imaginary. Del Racy. Let's see, Lou Terry. Jack Brooks. Lou Terry was a mid-morning, mid-afternoon. Lou Terry. Don Blair. Whose real name was Lou Gualtieri. Lou Terry lived in East Hartford. Bill Bland. A fellow with a, a goatee who was a good friend of Gene Pitney's. Go now, Moody Blues. We're on the go on the Love of the Lou Terry Show. Sir, I am until 3. We're getting about close to 27 this side of 3. At 3 o'clock, of course, Georgia will continue with a countdown of the top 100 uh, golden hits of 1965. And at 7 tonight, Gary Gerard will count on the brand new survey and also the top 40 from one year ago. Radio historian Ed Bruder. Lou Terry worked in the late 50s at DRC as the all-night guy. A lot of people forget that. He left there to go to WPOP and had the daytime exposure as the midday host roughly from 9 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon for about 5 or 6 years. Lou had a long run at POP. Lou was a known quantity in the marketplace. He was not the strong personality, um, the individual personality like a Joey Reynolds or a Ken Griffin, but he certainly had the stability part, and he was perfect for the midday uh, housewife's companion, which was so popular as a concept in the 1960s. He later went over to WRCH. Lou died tragically in a car crash on Hartford Highways back in the 80s, and Lou was over there when he, when he died in, in the car crash. Dan Clayton. Midday was a guy by the name of Bill Bland. WPOP, Bill Bland. Rusty Potts. Now, mid-morning was Bill Bland, who also called himself Captain William Bland, Jr. So, in 1966, Easter. Bill Bland. 1966, I made the drive from the Pacific Northwest to Connecticut to join WPOP. Sam Holman brought me to do mid-mornings, 9 till noon. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the William Bland Jr. Show at the much more music leader, WPOP Hartford. It was a typical mid-morning. Uh, that era, it was referred to as housewife show. Prior to Woody Roberts coming in, I was a real generic jock. I mean, you know, one of just tons across the country, nothing unusual or, uh, about me. That's all right. That's one of the features of the show. If you want to sing along, go right ahead. 22 minutes till 9. WPOP Springtime with Bill Blab. One of the greatest from last year. The Lovin' Spoonful. Do you believe in magic? It went like this. When Woody came in, I remember him using the word emote, which means, you know, to ham it up. And I thought, well, what the heck? Why not? And so I started to ham it up. And the hits keep right on coming. W-P-O-P, Hartford. 1130 in the Insurance City. And at that point, my ratings started going up. When Woody Roberts came in, we started doing on air a lot of bits. In this case, we were all up at a restaurant, the Nutmegger, that was the name of the restaurant. And we were talking and somebody said, well, the, 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 a song called, I'm gonna go to San Francisco and do the grizzly bear was popular. Don't ask me who did it, I don't okay. recall. But anyway, we were consuming a great amount of alcohol and somehow the, the idea came up that we should call Danny, who was doing afternoon drive at the time, and tell him we're going to San Francisco to do the grizzly bear. And that's how that started and that's all that there is to it. I have heard that story for the next, what, 40 years that I went to San Francisco and did the grizzly bear. It's, it's of course, not true. It was entirely something made up in a restaurant in the 
that afternoon and played out on the air. We did a lot of those kinds of things. It, there was just an awful lot of theater of the mind stuff going on. And we were pretty good at it. I, I did a pirate radio station. I got a rowboat and I got a, one of those old Mo Motorola two-way radios, FM radios. They were popular in the, in the 60s. The news uh, departments used them often. And I got one of those and I went out at Weathersfield Cove and set up a pirate radio station. <laughs> what is Some local police officer said, you can't be out in the lake broadcasting. It's against the law. And I informed him the Federal Communications Commission Commission would be all over his rear end if he didn't get away. And we did all this on the air. <laughs> and the audience loved it. It was real theater, but it was absolute nonsense. <laughs> A lot of fun. The leader, Where the bus jocks make it happen. Over $11,000 given away in that bus cash call jackpot. 11.32 WPOP cash call time. Jay and the Technics. You know, a lot of us spent a lot of years where if we just said, you know, I'm Bill Bland from WPOP, or, I mean, people would turn around and look, get big smiles on their face, and can I have your autograph? That's gone. <laughs> that doesn't exist any longer. But it was sure fun when it was going on. I bumped into a Connecticut disc jockey named Ken Griffin one day. Bob Paiva. And he told me that there was a job open at WPOP as the assistant promotions manager. And I went over there and got that job. And that's how I got started in radio at WPOP. I was there from 64 to 73. WPOP used to produce rock and roll concerts. That was my first job at PLP, was to bring concerts. And I used to bring a concert a month to the Bushnell, the, the Gene Pitney packages and so on. I think it was 64. I think I got the year right. <laughs> We brought the first Rolling Stones tour to the uh, Hartford area. We had the McCoys, the Standells, and the Rolling Stones, and the opening group was from New Haven called the North Atlantic Invasion Force. So I did that one because that was my job. I did concerts, so that was kind of fun. And we did it at Dillon Stadium in downtown Hartford. The kids got so excited they rushed the stage, and because they did that, live concerts were banned in Hartford for the next 15, 20 years. Well, it was very exciting Bob Piva. at that time because it was a highly competitive period in Connecticut radio. We competed for advertisers, and in order to get advertisers, we had to compete for audience. And we had a, a signal problem as compared to our direct competitor, WDRC. We couldn't reach a number of the areas that DRC had dominant signal in. And so we had to do a lot of promotions and a, a lot of gimmickry to try to attract audience. Rusty Potts. P.O.P. would refer to uh, DRC on the air quite a bit. You see, uh, Ken Griffin had worked for uh, P.O.P. just before Lee Baby came in as the evening guy, and Ken Griffin was the one guy who had good ratings up against DRC. This jockey should be people, and at Pop they are people. But some places they have their own image of what the disc jockey is, you know, and you know the types like, Hi everybody, it's time for a look at the weather, <laughs> presented by me. <laughs> It's 12 minutes before 10, and I'll give you the temperature right now. It's 62 degrees in downtown Hartford, and it's such a groove to be with you tonight on a, on a Wednesday night from the big song of Connecticut Radio, where it all begins, W, whatever it is. Uh, where's the station I'm working at this week? XYZ. Right, oh well. Oh, it's that late. Congratulations to Joel Spivak, who goes to KLEC and uh, Hollywood. Hi, everybody. God, I do love to play a record. Or two. <laughs> I love you, honey. <laughs> And he went across the street to DRC, which uh, he used to refer to on the air as the Big Drag, and then he went over to DRC. And it was a, a quite a battle between the two stations. Uh, there was no love lost between the two at the time. I don't know that we ever had any animosity toward Dick Robinson or, or McDonough or, uh, or anybody. Else. And, and uh, I, had a, I, I was personally friendly with Charlie Parker. That was, I went from assistant program dir pro promotion director to promotion director to music director to eventually program director during my period there. And uh, Charlie Parker was the program director at DRC for a long time, and I would bump into Charlie at conventions and so on, and we'd have a drink and we'd talk. And, I mean, there was, uh, I never took any of that stuff personally. Hartford at that time was a great feeder market. Ray Dunaway. So you had a lot of really good people working there. You know, people be driving through on 84 or whatever, and some guy from Boston would hear you and say, wow, this guy ought to be at RKO in Boston, or somebody from New York would hear you, or Philly, or whatever. So it was a great feeder market, both for talent and I think also for records. I mean, 
if you could get a song on, you had Bob Payev over at our place, who was our music director, and then you had the legendary Bertha Porter over at DRC. And, you know, if they could get a record on, on airplay in Hartford, it usually meant it was going to be a hit. Yeah. Bertha Porter, who was uh, the music director at WDRC, had, by virtue of her connections with a guy named Bill Gavin, who ran a, uh, a tip sheet, she was extremely well known for breaking records. And when I went to WPLP, the first thing, I, I recognized that and decided to jump in the pool. So I allied myself with another tip sheet guy named Cal Rudman. And uh, Cal used to promote the hell out of me, and Bill Gavin would promote the hell out of Bertha. And the result was that literally our names were known around the country. And so the fact that WPOP went on a record and logged it as successful or w, or Bertha introduced a record and logged it as successful, it would make the trade papers and the tip sheets. And, you know, some guy in Kansas would play the record because Bertha or Bob was playing the record. So it, it was a big time market in a lot of ways. You mentioned getting Beatles records ahead of time. Didn't WDRC have a similar arrangement with somebody else? or? Well, they did, but I beat them out because Pete Bennett used to manage an act called called Bobby Vinton. He called me up one day and I gave him a, I, I broke a record for Bobby Vinton called uh, Every Day of My Life. In thanks for my breaking the Bobby Vinton record, Pete started sneaking me the Beatle records in advance. And that was when I managed to beat Bertha at her own game. <laughs> and from then on, I had the advance on all the Beatle records. We used to do things like I would send Bill Winters down to WMCA in New York to pick up the record, and he'd have a radio car. And we'd contact Bill on air. He's in Stratford. You're only 40 minutes away from the new Beatle record. He's in New Haven. You're only 30 minutes away from the new Beatle record. And then we would get the Beatle record, and we'd put it on the air, and we'd put WPOP exclusive, exclusive through the whole record. And then, uh, but basically what I, the other thing I used to do is I would hold the record till 5 o'clock on Friday. No matter when I got the record, I would hold it till 5 o'clock on Friday. By Monday, birth his complaints would have gotten Bob Casper's office in New York City, the Beatles lawyer, to send me a cease and desist order. And I would, of course, gratefully say, absolutely, it will certainly cease and desist. But by then, I'd had the record on, <laughs> you know. And it was a game we played. You know, Casper knew damn well I had the record. He knew damn well I was going to play it because WMCA had the record. WMCA had it. They knew I had it. I remember a record called uh, Je t'aime mon appeler. It's a French record with Jane Birkin and Serge Gainsbourg. It was released on Mercury Records. And I'm told that the lyric was actually quite dirty. But it was in French, so who knew? <laughs> it was a beautiful melody line, and she was just, Je t'aime, je t'aime. And what I did is I had Mercury Records give me about 500 copies of the record, and I salted the stores, especially Belmont Records, which was then in an area of, of uh, Hartford, which was known as Frog Hollow because all the, the French people lived there. And I spotted like 10 or 15 copies of the record all around different stores around town. And I had Lee Baby Sims talk all week about this record that we were going to play that was just going to burn the wires. Well, Friday night when Lee Baby Sims went on the record, we blasted the record just about every hour. <laughs> By Saturday morning, people were clamoring for the record. The store had sold out of records. And, I mean, it was all over the wires. I mean, Chatham had broken in Hartford. DRC actually called us on Monday and said, we won't play the record if you guys will stop playing it because it's pornographic or whatever the hell they thought it was. And I said, screw you. <laughs> I, this is a promotional gimmick for me. Well, anyway, that's a shot of Jay Burkin, uh, who, of course, was the star of Blow Up, and Serge Ginsberg, who is her latest companion, uh, Je t'aime mon nom plus, right? Uh, that is hit by the big 14 to WPOB. I've got the audience with this record, and so I just kept blasting it. Then at 3 o'clock at 7 p.m., it was Dirty Dan Clayton. That's what he called himself. Working for you on a Monday afternoon. A hit line request call from Plainville. Plainville High. Clarence Carter. Cloudy skies, 32 degrees in the big city at 314 on the Danny Clayton Show. I called the program director, a guy by the name of Woody Roberts. Dan Clayton, 
And he hired me, I sent him a tape, and he hired me sight unseen. And this was in, it would have been 1966, or uh, early in 67, one or the other. Bill Bland. When I hear people say, oh yeah, WPOP, first of all, great set of call letters. Number two, the legend, I think, really started with the advent of Woody Roberts and Lee Baby Sims. There were a lot more people that worked there prior to that. Rusty Potts. Well, you had the program director, Woody Roberts. He was on early in the morning. Dan Clayton. Woody he encouraged it was all tongue in cheek. It was just a very weird kind of uh, top forty station. Petula, Petula Clark on the Woody Show this morning. This is my song from the Pop Music Survey. It's eight fifteen, Hartford. Woody was a real talent. Well, more than a real talent, he was a real leader. And I think the legend of WPOP really comes about from from that short period of time that he was there. The whole concept, the whole radio station, was to draw you in and be more than just you know, I got love in my tummy kind of songs that we were forced to play. And I remember one time, of course, this was all set up, but it was like on a Friday. I was supposed to get off at 6 o'clock. Lee Baby Sims called me on the air, and of course, I, I mean, called me and I put him on the air. And he says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm doing something at uh, New Britain High for da-da-da-da-da-da, and I'm going to be about an hour late. I said, no problem, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, I'll fill in for you, don't, you know, don't worry about it. So about 9 o'clock at night, he calls again. I said, where are you? He says, well, I'm, I got this thing, and I had to do this, and the bop, the beep, the bop, and, uh, but I'll be in in about an hour. Okay, so now midnight comes, and I've been on since uh, uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and, I'm, I'm, you know, and I, of course, people are calling in saying, and I'm, so I'm offering rewards. You know, if you see this guy, I don't know what's going on, because I'm, you know, I've been here 9 hours, and I'm tired, and, and uh, so now this goes on all weekend long. I'm there from 3 o'clock on, on Friday afternoon. It is now Sunday afternoon. I'm still on the air. And, uh, you know, I'm probably sounding pretty goofy. I never heard any tapes of it, and thank God. But and So the deal was, you know, if you see this guy, so I got people running all over giving tips. I, I saw him out in New Britain, or I saw him in Newington, or downtown Hartford, and, and I'm giving them the color of the car, and, and I'm going to give you $1,000 if you can track him down and catch him and, and uh, you know, let me know where he is so that I can get the heck off the air. So. Now, it, there was always some goofy trick like that going on, and, and most of it was pretty fun. So it, it was to suck you in, and, and uh, you know, we're never sure whether, you know, he's, he's been on the air. Jeez, he's been on the air 24 hours. What's, what's going on? So, um, and, and, you know, I had people sticking with me uh, all the way, listening, saying, you know, they, they weren't sure whether this was a gag or whether it was real or, or whatever. That was the whole concept of the radio station. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the Lee Baby Sims Show on The Leader. W-P-O-P, Radio historian Ed Bruder. Lee Baby Sims was very unusual for the Hartford market for the 1960s. He came in the, the fall of 66 to P.O.P. as their new night guy. Lee Baby Sims was a fascinating guy. Bob Paiva. He came to us from Texas. He hadn't had much more than like a sixth grade education, but he made up for it. Lee was the only person I ever met who actually used to read the dictionary. Every night of the week, he read words from the dictionary and memorized them and attempted to utilize them in sentences. I'll be all right after this. Go ahead, get a soda, put some aspirin in it, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. Gonna be all right, Lee, baby? Yeah, I'm gonna be all right. Yeah, the blues magoos, and we ain't got nothing yet. All right, Captain Jammers, let's work with it now. Let's work with that thing. Go! And he broke format regularly. In those days, it was pretty much play the records, say a couple things between them, and then play more records. But he used to stop playing music for lengthy periods, 15, 20 minutes, while he went on these long monologues. Kevin McKeown. And I can remember in the you know winter, I guess, of 66, 67, being transfixed by his storytelling and sitting in my car freezing to death, having reached my destination, but not being able to turn him off. And it wasn't that there were comic monologues like Joey Reynolds would have delivered, but Lee Baby was a storyteller, and he would dream up the most bizarre stories and work himself in as a character. The cry arose, who, what man among men will volunteer to carry food to these people? Not one man out of the millions in America stepped forward, save... One little old baby-faced boy who was sitting there saying, Hi, cats and jammers. Yes, it was me. I stepped forward, friends. I stepped out across that line, the indomitable line, to carry food, supplies, and medical things to these people in that far north country. A cheer arose from the crowd. Yay, Lee Baby! Yay, you crazy disc jockey! You can do it! Fight, fight with all your might! Take food to these people! I said, 
Never mind the accolades, never mind the praise. Just give me a sled, a team of good huskies, and I'll mush onward. I'll take the food to these cats and jammers up there in this far north land, up there in this village that's dying, freezing to death under hundreds of tons of snow, I said. He would do bits, for instance. One day he, he said to the kids that he had gotten bitten by a snake, and he spent four hours on the air dying. Between every record, he was, oh, what was me, what was me, and he was dying. And the next day he came in, he, his story was that the signal of WPOP not only went east, west, north, and south, but it went up, it went north, it went up. And a stewardess flying into Bradley had heard his cries for help and had rushed down from Bradley when her plane landed and given him respiration and saved his life, and that's how come he was there. One bit he did is he went on the air one day and he said that Woody Roberts, the morning man, had died. And he spent the whole show, whole four or five hours, doing a eulogy to Woody. Of course, the next morning, Woody was on the air and it was a planned bit. And Woody supposedly knew nothing about the eulogies. So the phones were going crazy with people calling Woody in the morning. And then Lee spent the following night angry as hell because Woody didn't have the decency to die. I mean, he had wasted a perfectly good eulogy, you know, and the guy didn't die. And it was a whole department departure from everybody else on Hartford Radio at that time, including his own colleagues at POP. Rusty Potts. He got me a following right away by saying Potts Rots all the time, every time he <laughs> referred to me. And people would call him, they'd say Potts Rots, and they'd hang up on me. <laughs> but I got a tremendous following at that station. He was a big help. We used to knock each other out of the air all the time. And his shtick was to, to be very aggressive and demeaning, which has become quite common in radio today, but he was quite new at it. The interesting thing about Lee Baby was uh, he supposedly hated Hartford. Um, there are newspaper articles from both the Times and the Current, uh, interviews with him saying how much he hated the market and how he didn't like the cold weather in the Northeast. Dan Clayton. Whether he really hated hard up for it or not, I, I never really knew. I mean, he just criticized uh, New Britain and hard up for it, and he would make fun of the city and the people, in the, but in a, uh, not a cruel way, but I mean, you know, in a funny way. He just did some very strange things. Whether that was a publicity stunt or whether that's really the way he felt, Lee Baby had his year, year and a half in Hartford, and then moved on, and uh, he's one of these people who worked at many, many stations. It's a good how could it be wrong? Gets a out of Led Zeppelin to the WPOB number three of the Poppy Wolves. Excitement, Becky Park, number one. The number one song is me, number three last week. It moved B.J. Thomas out of the number one spot. Hold on to love is the name of the ditty, and everybody digs it. Well, you heard it first in the big whole chain exclusively, naturally. Number 19, this is Jimmy Cliff. That's an old love. That's been a very high, a wonderful world. Beautiful people. Jack Armstrong was another one of these DJs. Radio historian Ed Bruder. That, that nobody really knew what to, to, to make of when he hit Hartford in 68. Uh, Dan Clayton. He replaced Lee Baby Sims from 7 to midnight. He was not there for even a full year, but he really blew up the airwaves at night. Very, very high energy. Motor mouth. His fast talking, his very funny, almost constant uh, comedy lines, one-liners. He broke format a good deal, but he still ran a fast-paced show, which was perfect uh, for the teenage market, which was what P.O.P. was looking for. <laughs> 25, 25, all kinds of strange, weird things are going to be happening. Uh, we'll still be here. WPOP will last through anything, I know. I just can feel it in my bones. You dig the music and all that kind of jazz, and I know you're going to stay around for Jackson Armstrong. It's the number one song. Ziggy Aaron Evans, I got you by the ears at 813 and a half. You stand by, because I got something from the past that is just going to do you all over again, I know. Well, I, I think he was the original. I mean, I didn't hear anybody else that would ever come close to this guy. I mean, he, he talked a mile a minute, and how he continued that energy... <laughs> is beyond me. Um, Jack pulled out in early 69 as his radio sojourn was a little bit like Rand McNally. If you look at his resume, he's worked at probably three dozen stations around the country, and most of them were pretty major stations, too. Dan Clayton. Earlier in the uh, my stint there, it was much more personality-oriented. Bill Drake. Bob Paiva launched what was called a boss radio format, which involved music sweeps, you know, 18-minute music sweeps, 20-minute music sweeps, or whatever. And Dan Clayton, who was then our program director, decided to introduce the formula, which was called boss radio, to Connecticut on WPOP. The boss beat WPOP. Danny Clayton adopted the fake Drake format. Chuck Krause. I call it that because we were duplicating what Bill Drake formatted stations did, but we didn't pay Bill Drake a license fee. We were just copying what Drake stations did. Later on, we kind of depersonalized the station and uh, went into a boss radio format, which was very successful, I thought. The music really was the star of the station. Kevin McKeown. Now, what this meant was that disc jockeys, instead of just being allowed to ramble on, were supposed 
supposed to condense their comments, so they came in over the intros of records, the outros of records, and you really had to think about what you were going to say, which I found to be an inter interesting challenge. Because it turns out you really can say quite a bit in 12 or 15 seconds if you've thought about it ahead of time. More music, WPOP. And so, yes, we did swing in that direction for quite a while, where we would have long music sweeps and limited commercial loads. And, of course, uh, we had the flower power uh, during the uh, Haight-Ashbury thing that was going on in San Francisco. And, and uh, P.O.P. Um, called itself your 5,000-watt flower pot, and they, they really played the whole thing of, of the summer of love. Ray Dunaway, WPOP. Came here to Trinity and got a job on the campus station, and then uh, about a year after I was there, ended up at uh, WPOP. Some guy was in town for the bridal fair, and POP was promoting, and he happened to hear me one Saturday or whatever. See, so you never know. If you're doing college radio, you never know who might be listening to you. And this guy called up, and he said, oh, you, Danny Clayton know you're in town? I said, well, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, I'm going to have him call you. I think at that time, they thought, well, you know, this will help us, because at that time, it was kind of like, well, TIC, where I am now, would have 60 shares, and then it was P.O.P. and uh, D.R.C. basically fighting it out for the younger audience. Danny, I think, was thinking, we'll get a college kid to do the night show. Yeah, and that'll bring hipness to the show. And, you know, so I, I think that's where that came from. So I went out there. They were down on uh, Cedar Street, 175 out in Newington. That time they were down in the swamp, and it was uh, where the towers are now, just off El Grasso, off uh, Route 9. So anyway, I ended up out there doing nights for a while, okay. about uh, a year. 6970 yeah, in there. Bill Love and uh, Lou Morton were doing mornings. Lou was the news guy, but they kind of worked as a team. We two midday guys. We had uh, Tom Jones, who was the music director at that time, I think. And then we had one of the best jocks I've ever heard, Bill Winters. Bill was on I think noon to three, and then Mike Green did afternoons, three to eight, seven. And then I did seven to midnight. And then we had a guy named Bobby Rivers. He used to do midnight to five or midnight to six. And, uh, you know, it was the Beatles. Were, and, and it was a weird time because Top 40, I think, was starting to feel, and it was a Top 40 station. Top 40 was where you played the, you know, 40 most popular singles. And it was at that time that you had the transition starting where, for example, at that time, uh, HCN came on the air. And HCN, all my classmates were listening to HCN. They didn't care that I was on 1410 AM. I mean, they'd listen. So it was a real trans, and a lot of AM stations that were doing basic Top 40 had to figure out ways to try and attract a younger audience. What they'd start doing is they added tracks. So we'd start doing album tracks. So I remember Nights in White Satin and uh, Alice's Restaurant. And occasionally after 7 p.m., then you'd start working those things in. But, you know, it really wasn't enough. I mean, it, it was tough to be in top 40 at that time. Danny Clayton, who I was working for, Danny was, I, I think, really a great guy to work for. But he was a member of the Theory X School of Broadcasting. So keep him scared, keep him working. So he had this huge light bulb above our head. And it was like a 250-watt bulb, and it was right to our left. And you're sitting there looking out on, on Cedar Street at that time. And what would happen is when he wanted to call you, he had the hotline, the private PD line. Whammo, he'd hit that thing. And, I mean, you could hear the guys panic on the air. You knew when he was calling. So we somehow managed to get a hold of the number. We used to sit out there in our cars. You know, there was a phone booth up at the Blue Danube or something like that, which was a place where he used to hang out. And you'd sit there and you'd call. And you could hear the guy just, you know, you see the flash come out of the light, lighting up Cedar Street. And then you'd see, you know, then you'd hear the guy. You know, it was fun. I mean, there it, it was, I, could tell you, I, I, I mean, I could tell you, oh, some, some POP stories were just horrid. You know, we just... <laughs> Oh God, it's such a great story, but I don't know what my what my limits are here. It, it doesn't reflect badly on me necessarily. It's yeah. just it, it's kind of how how it was in this. It may be totally politically incorrect these days, but the, this was a guy's business at that time. You know, you had women working in the office. You know, hey, it's the way it was, guys, in the late '60s, '70s. You know, woman on the air. What the heck is that? You know, it was Martha Jean the Queen in Detroit. She was the only woman I knew of on the air. And I do remember we used to do these things, the boss jock basketball games. We used to go out and we'd play high school faculties for a fee and what we do is we get a hundred and fifty the station would get a hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars we put it into a party fund at the end of the year and this is kind of an indicator of the, the beginning of the end for am radio at least as far as music was concerned but so anyway we had about three four thousand dollars so the deal was at the end of the year now bear in mind i'm like 19 years old okay yeah. i'm callow i'm a young guy yeah. 
you know, these guys, these guys have been playing the games all over the place. They've been at it for a lot. These are guys in their thirties, you know, high twenties, you know, some in their forties. So the deal was you'd pool the party money and the end of the season, you'd have a big party. And so what you would do is, and this was so, just so sad. I won't name names, but we went down, they got a couple of motel rooms down in Hamden, I think it was. And so we all drove down there and they went out, they bought a lot of liquor, they bought food, they had all this. And one of the record, the record companies, there was payola, but there wasn't payola. So the record guys were going to set us up with dates. Okay. No dates. Well, look, you know, this guy, one of the guys is calling the record distributor going, hey, what, what, what's, what's going on here? You said they were going to have good women. Going. All right, nothing. Now, okay, picture this. You've got seven guys sitting in two motel rooms in Hamden with plenty of beer and scotch and whatever and, and trays of cheesy deli food. And, you know, but wait, well, this was going to be a party. So, anyway, it's one of the guys says, well, you know, I know this waitress. I know this waitress over at some restaurant, and I've gone out with her a couple times. Maybe she'll, maybe she has some friends. Well, no. So they brought her back. Now, I didn't do anything. People, nothing happened. Can I make that clear? <laughs> nothing happened, okay? This was not, all of you in women's studies, don't get upset. This was not, it could have been, but it wasn't. So anyway, they bring her over, and, and one of the guys had been in the military, and he spoke French. So he starts deciding he's going to play one of the I, – I, I can't give names, okay? okay. I'm going to play one of the guys who was kind of an animal and, and at times could say things that were unwise. I'm going to tell her that she only speaks French. So, you know, he's speaking to her in French because she was from from uh, Montreal or from uh, Quebec. He goes, you know, come on, they're speaking in French. And so, uh, what, you want to ask her? Yeah. Ask her if, you know, it was these terrible questions, okay? And he's translating into French, okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, turns out they go, turns out she does speak English. Yeah. You know, it, it was just stupid junk. Turned out nothing happened. Yeah. You had 11 o'clock at night. It's like, Heck with this, let's go home. Yeah. This was, they were saying, oh, Ray, you, this is a party, baby. <laughs> I'm going, if this is it, <laughs> I think I'll go to accounting school. I think accountants at the end of the tax season have more fun. Seven minutes past 10 o'clock at WBOP, Big 14, with T.J. Lambert till 3 this afternoon. It was just a great group of guys. T.J. Lambert. It's almost like being in a frat house. You know, I mean, everybody knew everybody. We all hung out together. We all socialized. We all cared about what everybody was doing uh, on the radio. We all listened to one another. It, it was just amazing. We were all good friends, and uh, we thought we were doing pretty good radio. And I, and I think that everybody in town knew we were doing good radio, too. Well, what I did is I started this actually in, in Norwich when I was there. Bob Craig. Every day, at lunchtime, before we went into the newscast, I would make up this weird concoction of just something. I never meant it to really evolve into anything more than just come out with some stupid bit. And I really became known for doing these weird concoctions at lunchtime. And I'll give you an example of what it was, okay? I would say, today I'm going to recommend to my gluttons and gourmets a fried zucchini sandwich with strawberries and vanilla ice cream on burnt toast because it's lunchtime and then we would go in to do the newscast and for some reason this stupid little bit i became so identified with it that wherever i would go people would say hey bob what do you get for lunch today and mothers would call and say you know that's the only way i can get my kids to eat <laughs> eat lunch because they hear that man on the radio describing some silly lunch menu and the, the thing just you know really took off and became something that i was known for all my time in, in hartford I saw an ad for a Disc jockey uh, position at WPOP, applied for it. Lee Gordon, the program director, hired me. He and two other guys are roughly the same time, so uh, he was kind of overhauling the whole station. WPOP, how are you? This is Lee Gordon giving you the best music from Sly and the Family Stone. Thank you. It was as much fun as I've ever had working in radio. It was, uh, all the guys were, were great guys. We all got along. In every workplace, there's always guys that, you know, that everybody likes, and usually there are jerks. But in, in our case, everybody on the air staff got along with everybody else. I could probably tell you a few things without exactly naming any names. One of my associates on the air was doing his show, and we had a little speakerphone in the studio, and the fans would call up.
up, and once in a while, a female uh, listener would call up and uh, sound intriguing, and and so the uh, gentleman on the air might uh, be making some sort of arrangement to actually meet these people in person. We did have some people who would show up at the station, and one or two of them were kind of legendary for their, shall we say, uh, their uh, level of devotion. And in one case, a new jock had just moved to town. I, I can still remember he had, a, he had this dark blue Camaro, and he was hauling a U-Haul with all his earthly belongings from some town in the Midwest. Well, it happened that the station he had come from was a station uh, where a former WPOP disc jockey had ended up. So he had been hearing the stories of some of these particular fans, including this one really devoted fan, and including what song you had to play on the radio in order to it was like it was like the bat signal in Batman. If you played this song, it was like her cue to come over. And in fact, Dick Springfield knew this and took all, all the copies of that song out of the studio. Well, this guy showed up with his own copy. His first night on the air, he pulls out his, his copy of that particular song and plays it. And sure enough, the phone lights up. And uh, before the evening was over, he was being paid a personal visit uh, uh, in inside of his U-Haul trailer. <laughs> Sixty-nine, and turn back them hands of time. We're on the Grace Man Show. It's ten minutes after seven o'clock, and the, the sun is sneaking its little way over the horizon now. If you just got up, you should throw open the sash and look out the window, because it's pretty. All the little squirrels are waking up. All the little bunny rabbits are drying their little eyes. All the little birdies are starting to tweet. Uh, it's a delightful morning, and I'm making myself sick here with all this syrupy warmth I'm oozing out for you. But it's my job, and I'll syrup away as long as the check is here every week. Grease Man, I, I don't know if you remember him at all or, or any of the stories about him. Dude Walker. But he, he was a very mysterious character when he was at WPOP. Grease was Grease. Neil Steele. He was an experience. He was a trip. The Grease Man portrayed the role of a guy who had been through the rigors through life. Bob Craig. He portrayed himself as a guy probably in his 70s who lived in a flop house and drove to work every morning with a tr on a tractor. Almost makes me want to fall in love again. Smell that sweet perfume of warmth and joy. Huh? Uh, find me a filly. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I just will. Take a walk on Asylum Street tonight about 3 in the morning. See what I come up with. Oh, look, it's 15 minutes past 7 o'clock here at WBOB with the Grace Man. Keeping them coming for you. His persona was taken from, I think, his grandfather. Ron Lake. Not that he was his grandfather was a shadowy character. He told me at one point that Lee Gordon, yeah, parts of the character were sort of derived from his grandfather. I don't know. I, I cringe at the thought of family reunions because, well, my family, we used to get in such fights on holidays. Everybody would be glad to see each other for the first five minutes on Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving. And we'd all sit down to dinner and the bickering would start. My uncle Leroy would take himself a heap and help in a mashed potatoes that would choke a horse. And then somebody else would say, well, help yourself to some mashed potatoes, Leroy. Don't be bashful. But just the, the, the way he spoke and, and, uh, and everything, uh, he just played the part of somebody that had passed through town, needed a job, and, and landed on the radio and, and spent his days at, at the mornings at the radio station and the rest of the time at the flop house with the, with the gang. I once took a full hit in the face from a bowl of cranberry sauce. Splat! I just left it there, went to bed like that. That way, in the course of the night, if I woke up hungry, I wouldn't have too far to go for a snack. And they kept his identity secret. He would uh, do his program in the studio with the curtains drawn, so nobody really had a chance to see him. He would even pull the shade uh, in the control room studio so that people walking into the station there on Cedar Street in Newington couldn't see him at all. And because of that, it was a big mystique as what his grease man looked like. I think they even had a contest. What does what he look like? And it, it was fun to see all the, the drawings people sent in. He built up a very, very loyal following, and people were really mystified by his whole act and just the sound of his voice. Oh, boy. I don't know how I've lived this long under this pressure. It's about 20 minutes after uh, 9 o'clock here, WPOP. 9.20, temperatures up to 27 degrees. And what was even made more interesting is the fact that the more you listen to the grease man, the more you were questionable whether or not
thought this guy was actually an old man or whether he was putting on an act because everything that he said and describing his life and his lifestyle and recalling stories of his life gone by, he was right on target. It was like he actually lived in the 1930s or 1940s when indeed he was actually in his 20s, I think, at the time. You know, the voice he used on the air was not his real normal speaking voice, and you didn't know what he looked like, and you didn't know how old he was. I'm going to get on out of here, I think. Thank you so much for helping me keep my job. Only way I can keep it is if you listen every day, even just for a couple of minutes. (laughs) Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you tomorrow. He kept this mystique about him. There was a bar in West Hartford called Brock's that that was basically the semi-official jock hangout that we would all go to. It's now the Szechuan Tokyo restaurant. But it, at the time, it was an Irish pub and uh, and bar, and it was it was where we hung out literally seven nights a week for most weeks. And sometimes Grease would come out there with us, but people would constantly come up to some of the other guys and ask us about Grease Man, and he'd be standing right there. And so he he would enjoy that that the people yeah. would be constantly asking about him, and he'd be speaking in his regular voice, and so nobody would be any any the wiser that he was there. Rumors had been swirling, Lee Gordon, that the station was going to be discontinuing Top 40 Rock and Roll and switching to all news. And part of the reason that the rumors were swirling is because uh, NBC Radio Network started a network called the News and Information Service, NIS, and it was going to be a 24-hour all-news format that they would then distribute to any station that wanted it. It was set up so if the station wanted to have no personnel, they could just take it round the clock. If they wanted to have local news, they could do as much or as little local news as they wanted. They would get national news from the network. There were people who were involved with the news and information service with with NBC who knew other people in other markets, and so the word got out. Merv Griffin owned the station at the time. Bob Craig. And we had a terrific general manager named Al Pellegrino. Dick Springfield was the program director. Al Pellegrino was the general manager, and he was just a real sweet guy. I mean, he was just shoot-from-the-hip kind of guy. He was honest. He would level with you. And he told us, he said, you know, you guys are going to be leaving here. We're going to have an all-news station. And they were very good to us. And he was very kind. And we had a big celebration that weekend, digging out the old jingles. We had the grease man of the time was on the earth, T.O.P. And everybody had a chance to say their farewells. And it was just, you know, really, really well done. Go get him, Rufus, once you get started from WPOP. It's a few minutes after 3 o'clock on the final Bob Craig Show here at WPOP, the last live music radio program that the station will have. And it ends this evening at 6. Uh, Bob Craig did the, the, the very last show. Maybe even another lunchtime. But I don't know. Sorry to get real maudlin about this, but that's the way that I feel. And for me right now, it's time to go. Good evening. And uh, Grease Man's last show was was legendary. I'm going to leave a little giggling, so here's my little uh, ode to Hartford. Thanks so much for, for everything. They came up with a special song, Grease Man song. And-
When I first went there as an intern, it was the last days of it being a, a top 40 station. Jerry Brooks. But when you compare and contrast with today, you know, a station that played the hits also had a full service news department. Today, nobody does. Mm -hmm. I mean, only WTIC and I think WICC and Bridgeport have full service news departments. But since deregulation, stations just decided they didn't want to spend the money because they didn't have to spend the money. But in those days, WPOP and WDRC went head to head and competed in everything right down to who had the best newscasts. Both stations had news departments of four or five people. The news director when I started there, the guy who hired me was Charlie Steiner, who went on to greater fame at ESPN and, and is now the voice of the Dodgers. Right having been the voice of uh, the Yankees. People like Joe Connolly worked at WDRC, and Walt Dibble, before he was at TIC, was at DRC. And, you know, it was WPOP Hotline News, and it was WDRC Ear Witness News. Right. And, you know, it, there was a lot of competition. And, and that included news. No matter what the format was, you still wanted to have a really good news department, and a lot of us came up through those news departments. You know, my generation started in radio, where perhaps the generations before me started in newspapers. News the News and Information Service and seemed like a great idea. It was a fascinating concept that let a lot of stations make the switch to all news as more and more people were turning to FM for their music, slowly but surely around that time. You know, music was dying out on AM, and AM stations were looking for the alternative, and that's what it was for a whole lot of stations. Uh, and it, it, it gave them the flexibility to be all news. You didn't always have to have somebody there, although POP did. WPOP. Hartford, your news and information service in Connecticut, where it's 12 midnight. Good morning. This is a Tuesday morning, the fourth day of May, 1976. My name is John Berkey, and the news at the top of the hour, Victoria Fyodorova Poi, the love child of an American naval attache and a Russian actress, has given birth to a baby boy in Greenwich, Connecticut. It really was a great idea, but it was also very cost-intensive, which is what eventually caved it in. I started out doing midnight to six and would record the morning drive sports over the course of the evening. So, you know, I was sports director, but I was always on tape because I covered the overnight news shift. Working the overnight shift was interesting. You know, you had all the gamblers calling up, wanting to know the sports scores. So eventually, you know, and instead of, you know, taking phone calls from them all night, I just gave the scores over the air that I knew they'd want by just the margin of victory. You know, UMass over UConn by three. I knew they didn't care about the score. They just wanted to know. You know, so that's full service. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Jerry Brooks, and our top story at this hour, Vice Presidential Candidate Jarvis Tyner was in Hartford today collecting signatures on a petition to get his party's ticket on the ballot in November in Connecticut. You know, there, there were gangs at the time. The Dukes and the Earls in New Britain were going at it, and I did a news story, and, you know, one, you know, two o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. It's somebody from either the Dukes or the Earls going, we didn't like what you just said. We're coming over there, and I was just like, okay, you know... You know, I was very careful what I said for the rest of the night. Not great in the name of journalism, but when you're the only one in a swamp in Newington at 3 in the morning, you know, you got to watch your back. Yeah. Eventually, especially after NIS, you know, imploded, they stuck with the all-news format. Fred Swanson. When we dr dropped NIS, because they were just going off the air completely, we were able to get CBS from WINF in Manchester. So we had CBS News. Um, Al Pellegrino, who was the general manager, did. And, and then I went to doing live reports in the morning with co-anchors Bob Michaels and Joanne Nesty. And I did a couple of midday news blocks as well. But that's where Joanne and I started working together was at WPOP. You know, when I look back, I just smile. You know, like I said, Joanne and I would have dinner and just reminisce a little bit about the radio days. And all it can do is make you smile. Steve O'Brien. We had a, a ton of fun there, and it was one of the most enjoyable radio jobs uh, that I've had over the years. P.J. Lambert. You no, know, I still think it was a magical time and a magical radio station, and we did a lot of really cool stuff. Bobby Scott. Today, uh, radio, yes, I do listen, but my heart really belongs to the old Hartford days and the old format, in which I just think, again, was a lot of fun. I think fun is what it's all about, but my heart really goes back to those early days. They were just wonderful, magical days. This program is dedicated to those who participated in interviews but who passed away before the program was finished. Richard Ward Fatherly.
Joe Mulhall, air name Ken Griffin, Fred Swanson, Bill Bland, Jack Breitman, air name Jack Brooks. Last night I was getting my homework up and listening to my radio. I was kind of sleepy but was writing my theme while I was digging my DJ show. It was top 40 news and weather and sports and I was... You've been listening to Connecticut Radio Memories, Episode 6. This program was produced and edited by Brandon Camp. Thanks to everyone who participated in interviews for this series, including those whose comments didn't make it to air. Interviews were edited for time, continuity, and clarity. This series would not have been possible without the air check collectors and other people and organizations who had the foresight to save air checks, jingles, or theme songs, and who shared them with us, including Ed Bruder from ManForMars.com and WDRCOBG.com, Rick Kelly of Northeast Air Checks, Kevin McKeown, Ken DeVoe, Del Racy, Jerry Brooks, Bill Bland, Jack Breitman. We want to send a shout-out to Bill Hennessy and the bunch of old broadcasters who meet monthly to hear the Hartford Jazz Orchestra play at the Arch Street Tavern. Special thanks also to John Ramsey. Connecticut Radio Memories was produced at the studios of WWUH-FM at the University of Hartford. You're listening to WWUH West Hartford, a community service of the University of Hartford. Also broadcasting over WAPJ Torrington, WDJW Summers, and WWEB Wallingford. We also stream on, online at www.uh.org. If you go to the website and you hit the archive button, you'll be able to listen to any of the programs we broadcast in the last two weeks when you want to listen to them. Well, welcome to Wednesday Evening Classics. I'm your host, Michael Dolan, and I'll be with you till 8 o'clock tonight. Yeah, I'm going to play a little piece of music now, then I'll have an interview with two members, uh, of uh, Cuatro Puntos, and they have concerts, two concerts coming up this week, and they're pretty interesting, so we'll uh, get to that in about 10 or 15 minutes. But right now, we're going to start with the work of uh, Bella Bartok, his Rhapsody for Violin and Piano Number 2, and it's played by Bruno Canino and Mark Kaplan, Mark Kaplan excuse me. <laughs> 